same blue. We're talking about white blood cells and red blood cells. So part of the function of the spleen is to store red blood cells. So we have white pulp. And this is our lymphatic tissue. We'll talk about its organization in a moment. But organized in a very similar fashion to the lymph nodes and the tonsils. And then we also have red pulp. And the red pulp is formed of stored red blood cells. So in the dog, specifically on a treadmill, as the dog tissue became, the systemic tissue became hypoxic and needed more oxygen transport, the smooth muscle of the spleen contracted and that higher pressure pushed more red blood cells into the cardiovascular system, a natural blood doping without drawing out the red <laughs> blood cells first, which would increase viscosity to a bit, yes, but also increase the number of red blood cells traveling the circuit, and thus increasing the amount of oxygen that could be transported in the blood, all right? So you've probably heard about getting your second wind if you're out running for um, more than a couple miles or so. Um, this could be part of that factor, all right? Not just an adjustment in your heart rate and blood pressure, but additional red blood cells picking up oxygen transport. Um, so somebody who, the spleen is very friable, if you know what that means, it breaks apart easily. So if you've got clay that's pretty dry and not sticking together or sand or at the beach and when you squeeze it that just breaks apart, that's friable, all right? Because of all the cellular nature, this would also have reticular fibers. Um, if the spleen is ruptured, and we've talked about the spleen with the splenic branch of the celiac trunk, but it's tucked up in the abdominal cavity, it's tucked up under the ribs. So fractured ribs can tear into the spleen and tear it apart. And sometimes it's not worth the effort to stitch back all these cells, okay? Because they're just red blood cells and white blood cells everywhere. So the spleen may be taken out. In liver disease, pressure backing up from the liver can cause the spleen to enlarge two or three to 10 times its size. <laughs> so it may be removed so it doesn't rupture. So in those cases, people who have the spleen removed and have lost the storage ability of the red pulp are more likely to experience fatigue. They don't have those additional red blood cells to add back to the system, okay? The spleen, like the liver, is also a site <coughs> where uh, red blood cells are removed. So they become more fragile as they age and get closer to the three month, four month um, line of uh, living. And as they move in and out of the vessels to move into or out of the red pulp, they break down and macrophages will um, break them down as well. Okay, so that's the red pulp. Um, let's come back to this diagram here. So we know we have the splenic artery. So the splenic artery branch of the celiac trunk will enter into the spleen. And we'll divide to send various branches. And I'll just do this a couple more times here. And although I am not drawing the smallest of the branches, the very, some of the very smallest ones, and I'll just expand this one here, are known as central arteries, although they're truly arterial, okay? So around the central artery, we would have the um, lymphocytes, and I've been making them green, so I'll stick to that process. The lymphocytes form a cylinder, okay? If it's very similar to a lymphatic follicle, except it has this artery traveling through it. So it's fluid and it's a leaky vessel. So as fluid leaks out of it, it has to percolate through the lymphocytes in order to move farther and store the red blood cells. So let's label this vessel. So 
So central artery. And the lymphatic tissue is identified as a periarteriolar, that's why I said it was an arterial, periarteriolar lymphatic sheath, or PAL for short. Okay, so peri meaning around. Arteriolar, so arterial that's called an artery. So that would be the central artery. Lymphatic. So this is the equivalent of a lymphatic follicle, all right? It can develop uh, germinal centers. And so right around the arterial are where we find the B lymphocytes, and then the periphery are where we find the T lymphocytes. So we still can see the germinal centers and so on, okay? So here would be the periarteriolar lymphatic sheath. Here would be central artery. All right, usually off to one side of the periarterial or lymphatic sheet. And white pulp is just a generalized term for the periarterial or lymphatic sheet. So I'll put that in parentheses. The red pulp is red blood cells. White pulp is our lymphatic tissue or the periarterial or lymphatic sheet. The spleen is the only organ, by the way, that filters blood, which isn't that unusual because blood is supposed to be sterile, okay? However, if someone has had their spleen removed, not only are they more likely to experience fatigue, even though they don't have anemia, but if they are going to experience some type of dental activity, where there's a bleeding of the gums, you know, just the dental hygiene, if they have um, periodontitis where the, the gums bleed, a prophylactic antibiotic system is, or series is set up because if there is an introduction of bacteria to the blood via the um, wounding that may occur with the dental care, the person doesn't have the spleen tissue to clear that out of the blood. And so sepsis is more likely uh, to be a problem or endocarditis with a bacteria causing infection of the heart valves. So just as a prophylactic prevention activity, they would start taking antibiotics prior to um, any dental procedure. Okay. So those are the two major health concerns for someone who's missing a spleen. The lack of the blood filtration occurrence and the lack of the ability to store the red blood cells. So characteristics of a spleen are going to be the smooth muscle in the capsule and the presence of the blood vessel with the lymphatic tissue, the presence of the central artery, okay? No afferent lymphatics, but there are, because of all the lymphatic um, activity occurring here, there will be efferent lymphatics, which would then carry this flow into lymph nodes, just like any other efferent lymphatic would occur. Now, um, the veins in the spleen through which the red blood cells exit to enter into the red pulp have a very unique setup. That's why they're diagrammed this way here. They, uh, the epithelial cells of these veins are like the wood of a wine barrel. Rather than going in a circular fashion, they run linearly and that provides gaps through which the red blood cells can exit when they normally would not. So nothing I would test you on, but just kind of an indication of the unique arrangement of that histology. Okay. So here's just a large, differently stained. Of the, uh, here's the red pulp, all the little reds here are the capillaries. Here's the periarterial or lymphatic sheath with a couple of branches of the central artery or arterial. <laughs> and this is a diagram you have in your lecture notes showing the smooth muscle in the trabeculae, the arrangement of the lymphatics around the central artery, okay? And this is where the red blood cells would exit and move. So characteristics of the spleen, as I said, a lecture exam or quiz question would ask you to choose characteristics for a specific organ or identify um, 
what an organ is if I provide the characteristics. Okay. All right, the last organ we're going to look at is the thymus. And we'll be talking about the function of the thymus more on Wednesday when we talk about the purpose of T cells. So as you recall from the first week of class, the thymus, which shows up on our pediatric part over here, um, is largest at about the age of two, and then starts to involute, even larger than this one. You can be uh, a third of the region of the anterior chest if you're an anterior mediastinum. Um, and after about the age of two, the epithelial cells of the thymus are replaced. They don't turn into, but they die and are replaced by white adipose tissue. Okay, so most of us have just a very few thymocytes, if you will, that's the epithelial cells. The thymus is essentially a nursery for the development of T lymphocytes, hence <coughs> thymus T lymphocytes, okay? Um, B lymphocytes mature in the bone marrow. So T lymphocytes are pr produced in the bone marrow. That's where the stem cells are for white blood cells. But the T lymphocytes migrate to the thymus for maturation. <coughs> and we'll talk about why a little bit more on Wednesday. Um, however, the B lymphocyte actually comes from a term called bursa of rhesus, which is a structure in birds, which we don't have as humans. But bone marrow starts with B as well, so we can just keep the, the B lymphocytes. So T cells are going to do their maturation in the thymus. And just a quick background before we look at histology. T lymphocytes are cell mediated, all right? They pick up, now any of you that have had micro probably have heard of the term HLA, human lymphocyte um, antigen. We're gonna be using the um, major histocompatibility histo complex, MHC. But essentially what happens, just for a quick dirty look before we get to Wednesday, he said all of our cells that have nuclei, which means not the red blood cells, all of our cells that have nuclei have self-marking proteins on them. Remember, antigen um, marker surfaces. And they are unique to our own body. There's a segment, I believe it's chromosome six, I'll have to double check on that, that produces these unique antigens. And every single cell in our body that has a nucleus has the same set. So what we don't want to happen is to have our body produce an autoimmune response in which our T cells start attacking our own cells. Lupus, diabetes type one, there's a variety of Icenia gravis are types of autoimmune diseases in which this does happen. So the body sends these T cells through a two-step process that we'll look at in more detail on Wednesday again, but briefly, what happens is the developing T cells have to at least recognize the MHC complex molecules that are presenting these foreign antigens. If they don't recognize them, they are of absolute no use to the body. So they have to at least recognize the different cells that have these complexes on them. But what we don't want to happen is to have them be too sensitive and start reacting to them in an immune response <coughs> method. So it's that two step. If they don't recognize them, they're triggered to commit suicide. If they do recognize them, they're allowed to live, but if they react too strongly, they have to commit suicide. So what we're left with after they are in the thymus for a while then is a population of T cells that recognize the MHC class and, um, complexes, but don't respond too strongly to them, okay? Um, only recognize the foreign antigens that they might be producing. So they're exposed to all of our normal antigens that our molecules produce, and learn not to be triggered by them. So it's kind of, that's why we call it a nursery. It's kind of a developmental process. And if they don't pass the exam, they're triggered to commit suicide. So they're sent there from the bone marrow, go through this process, and then leave to populate the rest of the body and are able to multiply from that point on. So we really don't need the thymus anymore afterwards. Now in some immune compromised individuals, such as HIV infection, where they lose their T helper cells. There's been a keen interest in, can we make more T cells for these individuals for whom they have lost them? And in mice, they have found some 
telophysite still present in the thymus? Okay, so it's a source of research, but it hasn't been a huge, oh, we could reproduce the thymus and grow it back again. But there is some indication that a few of those T cells will remain. All right, so when we look at the histology, this is in a cat that has um, been high gluteraldehyde. So this is the heart right here, lungs. And this is the thymus, okay? This is an adult cat, not a pediatric cat, so. Now when we look at the thymus, it has lots of little lobules, so that's what all of these small pieces are, okay? It's fragmented, <coughs> it's got lots of indentations. These are not the crypts. You wanna be able to distinguish these from the crypts and the tonsils, all right? So these lobules are completely distinctive except um, depending on how close. If you cut it up here, it looks very distinctive, but they're actually connected. And each lobule has a cortex and a medulla, but nothing like the cortex or the medulla of a lymph node, which just has one continuous cortex and a central medulla. No lymphatic follicles in the thymus, okay? So there are dark regions and light regions, but no lymphatic follicles. This is not an area where we uh, filter through lymphatic fluid. Its purpose is the maturation of T lymphocytes. So what happens is T lymphocytes that are immature start out here in the periphery of the cortex and gradually migrate through to the medulla where they leave via efferent lymphatics. So there are efferent lymphatics present, but no afferent, of course, and no follicles at all. Histologically, nobody knows for sure why they form, but there are these little kind of coiled concretions of epithelial cells called Hassel's corpuscles. They're just a helpful indicator when you're looking at a microscope slide that you're looking at the thymus, okay? But essentially, this presence of dark and light with the lobular component helps you recognize that you're looking at the thymus. So there's a, a low power view, okay, giving you an indication of Cortex and medulla for each of those lobules, not one for the whole organ. No subcapsular sinus, no medullary cords or medullary sinus, no follicles, all right, just the cortex and medulla. There's a higher view. So this is not a germinal center, because this is not a follicle, all right? No follicles in the thymus at all. Okay, last question, and then we'll stop here. And, um, Move into lab. So which of the following is, I think I said this 20,000 times tonight, so I hope it pops right out at you. Which of the following is the only lymphatic organ to demonstrate afferent lymphatic vessels? Eight. 